All right, hi everybody. This is Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the AVP of Alumni Relations here at Lehigh. Um, I will be moderating this conversation with uh, Tom Gillis and I'll tell you about him in just a second. Um, the choreography of these webinars is um, dependent on your uh, participation and the way that we get that participation is through uh, Q&A. Um, Tom is gonna give a 10 minute um, overview of his company and cybersecurity and uh, what he does, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, there is a button on the bottom of your screen that says chat. Um, hit that and you will see a uh, box come up that says Zoom webinar chat. Um, what you want to do is type in where it says type message here. Make sure that your panel says to all panelists and attendees and just hit return. Um, when those questions come up, I will read them to Tom. Um, so um, I hope that you will have lots of questions for him as we go along. I should also tell you, especially on this about cybersecurity, we are recording this. <laughs> um, so um, this will be available afterwards if you wanna watch it later. Um, we had about 150 people sign up. So I, and about 34 of you now are on the call. Um, we have had Tom and uh, I don't know if you heard, but we have had a snowstorm here on the East Coast. Lehigh was delayed for a couple hours this morning. Schools are all closed. Um, as many of you know, when there's more than two inches of snow on the ground in, uh, in Pennsylvania, things just shut down. So I'm betting that a lot of people in the Northeast are watching from their homes. Um, but anyway, we're really happy to have you here, Tom, and everybody on the call. Um, a little bit about Tom, you read his bio in the invitation, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, but Tom actually connected through Lehigh through three of his children uh, who are Lehigh students. Um, a couple are now Lehigh um, alumni. He has a class of 15, class of 17, and class of 19. Um, Tom himself went to Tufts, so I'm glad he was um, spending time with us. Uh, um, he is the CEO of Bracket Computing, uh, which is a company that's about three years old. Um, they have more than $130 million of, um, of investments from venture heavyweights such as and uh, Andreessen Horowitz, Northwest Venture Partners, Sutter Hill Ventures, uh, Allegis Capital, Goldman Sachs, Fidelity. Um, so obviously these giant companies um, trust what they're doing and that's why we are so excited to have Tom here to give us um, some inside scoop about uh, cybersecurity. So with that, um, Tom, I will let you uh, let us what you know. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, hi, everybody. Yes, Tom Gillis. I'm uh, coming to you live from the Lehigh NASDAQ Center in San Francisco. Um, and I regret to inform everyone that it's like 70 degrees and sunny here. So we, we have the opposite problem that you have and that we don't have enough moisture, enough snow. Uh, yeah, I was skiing over, over the break and uh, it was pretty dry in Tahoe. So maybe if you guys just send some of that extra snow you have in a truck or something, we, we would appreciate it out here. Um, but a little uh, plug for the NASDAQ Center. Um, I think this is a, is a really big opportunity for Lehigh. Uh, as Jennifer said, uh, I'm actually not a Lehigh alum. I'm a Lehigh parent. Um, but I'm an entrepreneur. I've been really involved in tech ventures uh, most of my career. Um, and I see so much opportunity for innovation, so much opportunity for uh, uh, technology development. And all of that is gated by one thing out here. As I, I run a software company, <clears throat> those businesses are gated by talent. We need people. Great people make great products. Great products make great companies. And so it's all about attracting, motivating, and retaining the best possible people. Um, and when I first started to engage with Lehigh, I saw this incredible talent pool that really wasn't quite as connected with the, with the Silicon Valley job opportunities as, as it could be. Um, and so seeing programs like the entrepreneurship, the stuff that's being done at Baker, um, and now the, the Lehigh NASDAQ Center, which is a really kind of headquarters for all, I think is a really wonderful development for the school. And I'm really proud of the, the progress that Lehigh is making. My kids have had fantastic experiences there. And so I just think Lehigh is, is you know, sort of moving in the right direction and I'm happy to support in any way I can. One of which is to come here and talk a little bit about cybersecurity. So as Jennifer mentioned, um, I've been doing cyber all my life. Um, I've actually started three different companies. Bracket is the, the third one. Um, my second one was a company called Ironport that um, was a spam filter. 
Uh, I was acquired by Cisco back in 2007. After the acquisition, I took over and ran the firewall business at Cisco. So that's about a $2 billion business and it's, you know, like kind of the guts of, of security. Um, you know, and during my tenure doing security, it was interesting to note a very significant evolution of the security problem. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you're gonna be building security products or if you're just a person with a computer, you might be asking the same question, which is like, where's all this stuff coming from? Like, like who, who are the people on the other end of the wire that are, that are creating, you know, these, these attacks and these, and these problems? When we first started doing spam filtering, the vast majority um, of the attacks that we saw out there were motivated by fame. So, and that's just kind of a, a, a shorthand way of saying it was mostly like kind of just random, somewhat disenfranchised, maybe people with too much time on their hands, kids, people, tech people that were looking to create a publicity stunt. So the first viruses, if any of you have been using computers as long as I have, you might remember the Melissa virus, the I love you virus. They were emails that you would get that looked like they're coming from your friend um, and they had an attachment and when you clicked on the attachment it had like some dumb like moving icon. It's totally harmless, but literally billions of copies of these things replicated across the internet and everybody got copies of it. Um, and so uh, on the technology side, it was relatively easy to stop it because when you send a billion copies of something, you know, it's either, you know, uh, like a brand new breaking music video or it's an email virus. So it's pretty easy to do what we call bulk detection where we just look across a large sample size and we'd be able to detect and, and stop that. So that went on for a while and then very quickly, um, uh, the people that were, were using some of these techniques realized, hey, you know what, we can actually make a business out of this. And so, so the motivation moved from, from fame to fraud. Uh, and I use fraud in, a, in the broad sense of the word because sometimes they were actually selling real products, oftentimes they were not selling real products. And, and so spam was driven by transactions, like actually selling stuff. And, and um, uh, as I said, it might have been prepaid phone cards, which are real things that you would actually buy and you would actually get. But most of what we were seeing was um, uh, illegal pharmaceuticals. Um, and so, so this might be sort of entertaining, but the, uh, the, one of the, the largest categories of illegal pharmaceuticals was Viagra. And so we would see huge amount of uh, volume that was pushing Viagra. Um, and we did some studies into like, what, like, what is this stuff? And so we, we, and we're a bunch of engineers. We're not like detectives or scientists or anything. So this was, <laughs> This was a bit of an adventure for us. And so we, we, um, we started to analyze who, who's this coming from? We had these sample emails. They were very, very funny. Um, and it was, it was the, 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 the website was called mycanadianpharmacy.com. And when you went to the site, the spam emails would drive you to the site. And when you went to the site, it was, it was actually a very compelling website. It looked very legitimate. And there's a picture of, you know, Dr. Jack Carpenter standing with his arms crossed and he's got a white coat on and a stethoscope over his shoulders. And, and, uh, you know, he said that his, his mission was, um, you know, he was upset by the U.S. government's policies to deny its citizens affordable uh, medications. And so he's going to sell uh, medication out of Canada to anyone that wants to buy them at low prices. And here's our address. It's in Toronto. You know, it's such, and such, such an address. And here's the doctor and his staff. And, and you know, go ahead and buy this stuff. So the first thing we did is we bought a bunch of the stuff um, and we sent it to a lab and uh, we, bought, we bought a bunch of Viagra and this was actually pretty funny. We, the, the samples came in and they were, we bought a bunch of different samples under different uh, pseudonames with different addresses. Um, and when we gathered them all up, they looked physically very different. Some were dark blue, some were light blue. One, one of my engineers says, oh, that's not Viagra. And we're like, wait a minute, like, how would you know what that is? But um, it was kind of a funny moment. Um, we sent them out to the lab to be tested and what we saw was that, that it was, some of them were just placebo, like just pill binder. Some of them were actually Viagra, and some of them were Viagra in, in uh, too strong a dose. Mm -hmm. so, so we started doing more analysis, like what is this operation? So we had some uh, uh, engineers in Canada, and we sent them to the address of, on this website. And we went up there, and they sent back pictures, and it's a vacant lot next to a Subway sandwich shop. So there's no hospital there. There's no Canadian pharmacy. And we did a bunch more analysis, and we traced it back to um, an organized crime organization. We, I mean, literally had to go through like front organization after front organization, but the drugs are being sourced in China and India. Um, they were coming from, from um, large scale manufacturers that were either running on the side or, you know, having unlicensed businesses or, you know, someone was find a way to like, you know, parasite off of these operations. 
um, so you know, shipped out of uh, somebody's apartment, so a residential apartment in India, um, and then delivered through these series of shell companies, um, uh, you know, to the end users. And it was it was money that was changing hands. So at that point, we turned it over to the FBI and let them go investigate it. It's very very difficult to prosecute these types of things because. Um, the internet is inherently very anonymous. And so it's, it's extremely difficult to trace back, like where'd this stuff come from? And you know, what exactly was the source of it? Uh, because it's, it's all too easy to hijack a computer and use your computer as an intermediary for one of these transactions. And the term for that is a botnet. You might've heard this term before. Um, uh, there are literally tens of millions of servers that have been infected with the machine and that are controlled remotely to act as a relay agent or a, um, a proxy for an illicit actor that's doing something on the internet. <clears throat> and so we spent a lot of time trying to analyze and, and detect these bot botnets. And we got to the point where we, we, we could do this really, really well. Like our spam filter almost never made a mistake. It, you know, like you would think for most people that were sitting behind our filters, uh, and this is around the time that we were acquired by Cisco, so if you ever sat behind a Cisco spam filter, you, you might not even know because somewhere in your IT organization, someone made that decision. But for the most part, spam would just go away. Um, and so life was kind of good. And so we had things under control. Um, but it was in, in uh, I think it was early 2000s that the game changed. And the reason the game changed is um, the Iranians were developing nuclear weapons and everybody knew about that. Um, and so um, uh, the United States, in you know, cooperation with Israel, well, it was really the Israeli military, but the U.S. was certainly uh, uh, cooperating with this, uh, launched uh, an air attack against the enrichment facilities in Iran. Maybe that was the late 90s. I forget exactly when that was. Um, but it was you know, a physical attack. They took a squadron of F-16 fighters, and they flew in a very tight formation using terrain-hugging radar. Uh, and were able to avoid um, uh, air defense systems and deliver the strike. It was extremely risky. Um, you know, it had some civilian casualties, although they were small because they struck on a weekend. They were not trying to, to, to kill people, but they wanted to remove, remove this facility. Uh, and it set the program back, you know, some number of years. The Iranians responded by saying, oh, okay, if you're gonna go after our enrichment facility, we're just gonna build another one and we're gonna put it in a mountain. And so they put it in a mountain in, in a city called Nans. Um, and they, they did a, program, a technique called air gapping. So it was not physically connected to the internet in any way. And um, someone, and we don't officially know who it was, but we're pretty sure we know who it was, um, uh, which is members of, of uh, the US intelligence community, um, working with the Israelis, uh, created a virus called Stuxnet. And um, the way this virus worked, it was, it was uh, delivered on a USB stick so some operatives actually like a janitorial staff or someone just penetrated the non's facility and set usb sticks down you know on a desk and think about it you come into work and you're doing your your daily work and there's a usb on your desk and you're not exactly sure where it came from you don't remember but you know you're quite likely to plug it in and use it in fast files around well as soon as someone plugged it in the virus came alive it took over that person's computer and then without any con connections back to a command and control center. This virus was operating autonomously. It started to propagate the network. It would move from machine to machine and find vulnerabilities because it was looking for a very specific target. It was looking for the industrial controller on a piece of Siemens equipment that was used, it was the centrifuge that was used to enrich the uranium. They would spin it at very, very high speeds to try to bring out the, the highly radioactive uh, uranium from the less radioactive uranium. Um, and uh, this was a relatively simple um, computer in this controller. It had an 802.86 processor, which is, if you know anything about computers, that's kind of like the second generation of the real Intel processor. So very, very, very simple, very primitive, and so old and um, uh, you know underpowered that actually writing code to hijack it was it is a very, very sophisticated piece of, of uh, engineering that went into creating this virus, having it self-propagate, having it find these controllers. But what it did was it would hijack the controllers in a way that they would send communication back to the control center and say, yeah, everything's fine, nothing to worry about, but they would tell the centrifuge to spin wildly out of control and they would physically explode. These things would like, burst. Um, and, and the Iranians could not figure this out. And so it set the program back years, and it was a far more effective technique 
than the very dangerous, very high profile, very politically risky military action that had been taken, you know, uh, almost a decade earlier. And the whole world took note. So what happened was this virus got out in the wild. When I was in Cisco, we were analyzing it. We're like, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> it was just crazy and so different than anything we've really seen before. And so, so the motivation went from fame to fraud, you know, to really became political motivation, right? And and so the the you know fate of nations could actually be influenced by cybersecurity. And so what we see now is you know everyone has got in the game. The thing to remember is that the, the people that started this game was the United States. You know we have the most sophisticated, both offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. What has been a real challenge for the the uh, intelligence community and, and the federal government is that the policies around how we treat cyber, how we treat these capabilities um, uh, are still very ambiguous. And that is because in this country, we have a very clear separation you know, of what is public and what is private sector, um, you know, kind of church and state type separations. And so, so we treat our cyber capabilities as a military asset. Um, in fact, if you look at how the military is organized, you know, wars used to be fought by, you know, men with sticks and, and bows and arrows, and that was the army. And then people realized, you know, we can actually put those men in boats and, and achieve advantage, and so they created the Navy, and then they realized we can put them in airplanes, and we created the Air Force, and then we actually realized we can put assets in space, and so we created Space Command. So each one of these is a domain of war. The military is now organized around cyber as the fifth domain of warfare. And this is big stuff. This is not small. This is, is things that can win or lose um, uh, wars. There's been a lot of speculation that the US has used cyber capabilities to slow down, possibly even still handicap the North Korean missile development program. Um, very hard to prove that, but it would certainly be a reasonable and likely target and a probably a very effective thing for the United States to do. So, so we now have a situation where there are thousands tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of professional engineers that worked in the business of compromising other people's computers. And so one of the, the biggest things that we see ha has uh, come as a consequence of this is that an attack on a computer is no longer, you know, a billion, literally a billion with a B copies of the same virus. It's now an attack of one. Um, and that fundamentally changes the way we think about defenses because all of our defenses before were built around a signature, something that would identify, oh, I've seen this before, we know it's bad, therefore block it. So the inherently reactive. When we have an attack of one, an inherently reactive system is useless because you've never seen it before. Um, and so what the industry is working on, and what my company is working on, is, is building uh, proactive defenses that don't need to know anything about the attack. Um, and so, so at Bracket, what we do is we are focusing on creating technology that can harden the innards of the operating system. And this is very, very techy stuff. And so I'm not going to do too much detail unless people ask and, and want to know, because I'm sure there's some uh, engineering graduates on this broadcast that are like, wait, what is this? So, um, uh, but the kind of the, the, the summary of what we're doing is um, most security solutions rely on what's called an agent that runs in the operating system. You're probably all familiar with this in your own laptop. You have a, a McAfee or a Symantec antivirus program, that's called an agent. It's, it's a program that's run by the operating system. Any time a program is run by the operating system, the operating system has higher level of privilege than the program itself. And so, so um, uh, what happens with these directed attacks, these very sophisticated attacks, is that they find a way to compromise the operating system and to gain higher privilege than the antivirus agent that is running. Um, and so, so once they embed themselves into the operating system, the antivirus will ask the operating system, hey, have you seen any viruses? And of course the operating system answers back, maybe with a Russian accent, no comrade, like no viruses here. Um, and therefore they can maintain a presence in your server or your computer for months or years. Um, and that's what we're seeing happening. If you look at like the Equifax attack, um, you know, target, uh, the attack on target, uh, HBO, um, even at Sony, the one thing these have in common is that these attacks took place over, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months. 
So persistence is a really big problem because they get in and they stay in. Kind of like that Stuxnet thing where like they got on one computer, but then they popped all around. They were in there for a long time before they found the right target um, and took the action they need. Um, and so what we're thinking about is, hey, oh, well, let me further explain how they can achieve this is that they get into the operating system and they become undetectable, right? And so, so at Bracket, our idea was, could we make software that is actually not resident in the operating system? So think of it as a layer underneath the operating system. Uh, it uses virtualization, so it's, a, it's actually a form of a hypervisor that runs outside of the memory space of the OS, but it's attached to the OS. It's kind of like we're like, you know, a supervisor that runs under the OS, and we can see things happening in the OS that the OS can't see us. Um, and so it allows us to have privileges that allow us to identify if a, an operating system is being compromised. And furthermore, we can actually interdict or intercede those attacks and we can prevent an operating system from being compromised by, by denying modification to critical parts of the kernel, the critical configuration files, et cetera. Um, and so the, the, this product is aimed at um, the servers that run in a data center. We, this is not, this is too sophisticated to run on a laptop. Um, and our target customers are large enterprise customers. And as Jennifer mentioned in the, in the outset, um, uh, uh, some of my customers are, are folks like Goldman Sachs, uh, Fidelity, uh, General Electric. They're also investors in the company. Um, so yeah, so we, we were, we're excited about the work that we're doing. It's very, very uh, technically challenging. We've been working on it for years, um, and, uh, but it's very promising. And I feel like it's a very radically different approach to security, not just sort of an incremental step forward. Uh, and there's a lot of pluses and minuses to doing a project like that, but uh, it's certainly been a great journey and, and I'm, I'm blessed to have such uh, great investors. Great. Well, so, great. yeah. Thank, I just wanted to thank you and remind people um, about the chat. Um, so uh, click on the bottom of your screens there where it says chat and a box will come up where you can type in your questions for Tom. Um, I don't see any right now, but um, we had talked about a couple questions uh, while people are writing their um, their questions to us. Um, as you were as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the movie that you should star in. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I think that might be a comedy, but uh, you know, fine. Yes. <laughs> aim to fraud, or maybe Viagra to voting. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I had a question. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that um, that some of the things you discovered you turned over to the FBI. Do you do that regularly? Yeah. Are you in touch with the U.S. government regularly? Um, uh, you know, honestly, we try to avoid that. Like, we're an engineering company. We're not in law enforcement. So when we get uh, requests, we, we always uh, answer, them, uh, answer them, but generally not so much. At Cisco, we were so large and we had such a larger presence that we had a regular – collaboration communication with, with authorities. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting is I, I talked about that line in cyber between um, you know, public and private entities. And so um, while the US government does not use our cyber capabilities for commercial purposes, other governments do. And this is what is so um, challenging for the US. So how do we respond, right? So if, if there's a cyber attack on a bank, if there's a cyber attack on uh, you know, an aircraft manufacturer and they steal a design for a stealth fighter, which there's some evidence that, that that happened. Is that an act of war? Is that just a commercial problem? Who's responsible? So the way we have uh, evolved is there's a very good exchange of information between the cyber community that are pursuing uh, government agenda and folks like, um, the, you know, my team at Cisco or, or Bracket where we're pursuing a commercial agenda. So this is, and we have, it's like, you know, we're just fighting bad guys together. So there's a good exchange of, of information, but there's definitely a line there. And, you know, we're in the business of building and selling software. They're in the business of, of prosecuting bad guys. And, that, and those are two different businesses. So. Right. Right. Um, Barry Sure has a question. Says, Tom, does your organization plan to develop a solution at the chip level? For example, the recent Spectre flaw. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you, Barry. That's an awesome, awesome question. So, uh, breaking news, I haven't announced this to anyone. We actually solve uh, the meltdown problem. So, there's two flaws there's meltdown and Spectre. Um, these are the worst security breaches I have ever seen, ever, like ever. It, it, it's, it's not a bug, it's, it's a 
exploitation of a fundamental property of microprocessors and that they do speculative execution where they look ahead and try to execute. That's what makes them go fast. So like, it's really hard to patch this. Like really, really, really hard. And so basically you have to come up with a way to like not have it speculative be execute and the performance is unbelievably slow. So if anyone has been running servers on Amazon, um, you know, like January 5th, they like suddenly got cut in half. And literally the servers, the whole internet just slowed down because people were applying these patches to try to protect against this vulnerability and the performance was crippling. Um, uh, our approach does not, to Barry's question, does not get involved with any firmware or hardware but we inherently are isolating the memory of the guest in a way that it's not susceptible to the meltdown attack. So it can't be read by an attacker. Um, Spectre is different and worse. And we, there's a couple different variants of Spectre. There's some that we have a unique solution to and some that uh, really are, I think are gonna require application level changes. Um, and so that's, that's a work in process for us. But, but uh, yeah, this, this is a really, really, really big problem, and the whole industry is kind of running around in circles, like trying to respond. To that. And the response is still ongoing. Like, there's not a clean solution that's out there now. And did you say who who created Spectre? Do you know? Well, um, so interestingly, it was done by good guys. Um, so there was there was a, a team of uh, security collaborators that that were thinking about like what if, right? What if? What if? What if? And um, uh, and I think they were from you know big giant companies like Intel and Google you know, and others, um, like my team at Cisco used to do this, where we just, we would look for vulnerabilities. And then when you find them, you very quietly and carefully disclose them to the vendors so that they have time to respond. Um, and so, so these researchers found these flaws or these what they called exploits um, six months ago. And they did a very good job the industry does a good job of keeping it quiet because as soon as it comes out, then bad guys will actually take advantage of it. And if a patch isn't ready, you just got a wide open hole. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that even after six months, the patches are, are mm -hmm. sketchy. Like it's it, like, it's a really, really hard problem to solve. So Meltdown has more clear um, uh, protections you can put in place, but it cuts your performance in half. That's a drag. And in many cases, totally unacceptable. Um, Spectre, there's still aspects to it that, you know, we really don't have a good solution to the solving right now. And so now the, the one uh, mitigating factor is that the Spectre is extremely complicated and, you know, you, there's no amateurs that are using that attack. It, it, it's very, very complex vulnerability. You need scientists, but the folks that are in what we call nation states, including our own, uh, are absolutely capable of exploiting that. And maybe they found it before the researchers did. And so they've already been using it. Um, so yeah, it's a mad dash to try to close that, that one up. And if that's of interest to anybody, you can reach me offline. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I never want to overrepresent um, our solution because this is a super hard problem, but we do have some really unique capabilities there. Yeah. Um, so from an individual standpoint, um, this is kind of scary stuff. Um, and yeah. using a work computer, you sort of assume that your company is guarding its work secrets, um, but for individuals, what can we do? Does Norton antivirus work for this kind of stuff? Um, so, you know, there's just like plain old common sense. Um, uh, you have to make the assumption that, uh, you know, computers can be penetrated. Like your work computer, just because you don't see the virus, you don't feel the virus. You know, there's many in the intelligence community that say every corporation has been hacked or penetrated. And the question is, you know, are they doing something meaningful? That's those are two separate questions. Um, um, but yeah, don't 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 inherently just trust your computer because you're probably mistaken. Um, uh, now, <laughs> it's unfortunate. Um, uh, so what can you do? Um, uh, use strong passwords, common sense. Use one of these password keeper apps that will encrypt the passwords. Don't write them down on a sticky. Don't put them in a, uh, um, you know, the notes file in plain text because that's the first thing that attack. Yeah, exactly. Like most people do. Um, but that's the first thing the attacker. Yeah. First thing the attacker will do is, is read your passwords. So that it's almost like you don't, you don't have a password. So that's bad. Um, uh, encryption is really, really powerful. And so, so uh, the problem is also kind of hard to use. So encrypting email, I used to at Ironport, we actually sold an email encryption product and it's very strong and very secure, but man, it, it it fundamentally changes how email works. And so that's, that's a, a big, strong step. You'll notice that your bank will send you encrypted emails from time to time. 
Um, so if you're if you are really concerned, that's a good thing. For me personally, I'm I'm careful about my passwords. I change them. Um, you know, I don't leave credit card information in plain text, um, uh, and I use one of these password things. And that's the best you can do. It's not a perfect solution, but you know, they're not really going after you. Um, these these attacks are going after high profile targets, and they're using you as a stepping stone to get there. Right. Right. Uh, we have a question from Mark Miller. Uh, Tom, what application is there to protect voting integrity? We could probably do a day and a half on just that, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a great, so the answer is not one, um, um, but like that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at, right? How do we ensure that the servers that are running in a data center, or perhaps a government data center that's doing, doing uh, voting, we're looking at guaranteeing the integrity of those servers. And no one can guarantee it, so I should say assuring um, you know, the good news is, remember we talked about the spam thing, like we, we didn't catch all of the spam, but man, we caught like most of it, you know, so for all intents and purposes, you know, we can create very strong defenses. The counter to that, you know, sort of optimistic view is that it's a different world now where, where all it takes is one. Cyber is kind of like missile defense where, where you know, a really well-engineered system might stop 99.9% you know, of the attacks. But you know, if someone shoots a thousand nuclear missiles at you and you shoot down 999 of them, you know, while you, you might be very impressed with the, the technical results, you know, there's a nuclear weapon that got through. So all it takes is one. Um, um, and so I think we have to be very proactive and very diligent in our observation of the behavior systems. Um, you know, and we have to assume that, that, that exploits are going to happen and then think about contingencies. Um, uh, so. I'm, I'm not saying don't use online voting. That's that that that's uh, a big step back. But if we're aware of the possibilities and the danger, then we can be more vigilant about identifying when there might be fraudulent behavior that's taking place. Okay, thank you. Um, so it is uh, past twelve thirty. So um, we are going to be wrapping up now. Um, but uh, Tom, you invited people to contact you directly if they uh, had more questions. What is your email address? Yeah, I'm Tom, T-O-M at B-R-K-T. That's uh, the stock ticker for my company, which doesn't exist because we're private, but uh, someday maybe it will. Uh, Tom at BRKT.com. Uh, and always happy to talk to Lehigh folks about if stuff people are interested in the work we're doing, if there's people are interested in entrepreneurial uh, activities, if people are interested in the uh, Lehigh NASDAQ Center, those are all mm -hmm. topics that I care about. So. Yeah, and, and to plug the Lehigh NASDAQ Center um, more, if those of you who are on the call happen to find yourselves in uh, San Francisco, there's always great events going on there uh, through Lehigh and just through the NASDAQ Center itself. So check out their website uh, if you're going to be out there and spend some time there. It's a really great space. Yeah, and if, if alumni are interested in getting involved, there's lots of opportunities uh, for mentorship, for engaging with students, uh, doing guest lectures and stuff. And so um, Samantha DeWalt is the head of the NASDAQ Center out here and uh, is a good uh, point of contact. But there's, you know, this is a great opportunity for the Lehigh community to rally and really create a presence in the Bay Area, which I think could be lasting and very meaningful. Yeah, and uh, for our Lehigh alumni, is Bracket hiring? We are, absolutely. Uh, I've hired many um, uh, undergrads um, in the engineering sector. And so, yeah, uh, always willing to accept uh, uh, applications and resumes. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you again, Tom. Um, okay. and thank you for everybody on the call. Um, Blazer says, great session, really interesting, thanks. <laughs> um, and there is a survey that we're sending out. Um, we've done a bunch of these and I think they get better every time we do them, uh, thanks to your feedback. So please do uh, click on that link um, when you get it in your email or right here through the chat window. Um, and have a great day, everybody. Stay safe if you're in the Northeast and driving anywhere. And thanks again, Tom. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.